I guess that was just all right, you know. It was beautiful. It was amazing. <laughs> it was so good. It's so good to, to hear our choir and orchestra uh, today. Um, my name is Travis. We are continuing on in our study of First Timothy, uh, looking at this idea of paradox and this idea that the way of Christ sometimes calls us to live in a way uh, that is contrary to the way in which uh, the, uh, the world around us desires to live. Again, culture is not bad. It's not evil. It just is. We're a part of culture. Uh, but sometimes the way of Jesus uh, makes us run counter, swim upstream against uh, that which our culture would have us do. And one of those things uh, is, is one of the more controversial things in our culture uh, today. It's actually one of the most controversial things I think we're going to talk about in this entire series. And it's the nature of intergenerational intergener- relationships. Intergenerational relationships. Uh, we're talking about aging today. We're talking about the elderly And I think it is difficult to talk about this because in our society, we have been trained, we've been conditioned, we've been groomed that novelty, that youth is beautiful and good and that which is old is to be set aside, right? We even have an expression for it. We say good as new, good as gold. I like good as gold too. Good one, Stephen. (laughs) Works too. Good as gold. All right. Good as new, right? Good as new. Novelty is, is, is desired. If, if you have a two-year-old iPhone, it's, it's old. Get rid of it. What are you doing with that, that thing? Get something new. Any of you have, still have like a Nokia, like the indestructible Nokia that cannot be destroyed by, by any power known to man? You can roll over it with a car and it's still intact. It's good as new. We like new things. We're obsessed with beauty and looking Beautiful. And looking youthful, and those things, youth and novelty, we consider to be beautiful in our culture. We idolize youth to our detriment. So what I want us to do today as we look at 1 Timothy chapter 5 is I want us to look at the way in which Scripture calls us to find beauty throughout the spectrum of our ages. And one of the things I want to focus on is the church, and not the church, capital C Church, but our church, how Park City's Baptist Church is unique in the way in which we're positioned to pursue these beauties, these three beauties that I see in our passage today. And so I'm going to start by reading 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1. I'll read the whole passage. It's a little lengthy, but it's good for us. Verse 1 of chapter 5, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night after day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well, so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work, but refuse to enroll younger widows. For when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Now out of this passage, let's look for three beauties. The first is the beauty of the church. Now it wasn't until about 150 years ago that people really started to worry about age. And what I mean by worry about age is start to segregate the population into age demographics. It started sort of in its infancy in the industrial revolution when we divided the population into those who were old enough to work and those who were not, uh, who were too old to work. And so those people were not considered a part of the revolution, and then the the people that could work were in the factories. 
When you move on through history, you get to the 1930s, and that's when the advertising agencies began to market uh, uh, items to mothers of toddlers. They realized that that segment of the population wanted specifically targeted things to them. And then the advertising firms just kind of extrapolated that details and continued to break uh, the population into age segments. This is for children. This is for young teens. This is for teenagers. This is for young adults. And this is for senior adults and so on. Even our our toys today, by the the time we get today, there's for ages three and up, for ages 12 and up, right? We we say how much, what our toys are meant for, right? We have ages to uh, enter into the military, ages to drive, ages to drink. You shouldn't, but if you do, age 21, right? Ages to smoke, age, age, age. When I was in the army, we have a mandatory retirement date. It's all based on age. But when Paul wrote, society had not been broken into these sort of stratified places based on age. When Paul wrote, he was writing to a group of people that that lived together, who worked together, went to church in the same room together despite age differences. And what he writes is very uh, appropriate. It says, verse 1, do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. The guiding principle here is that everybody in the church, regardless of age, should be treated with dignity and respect. And his guiding principle for that is treat people in the church the way that you would treat people in your family. And he gives guidance based on that. Older men should be treated as fathers with the same respect that you would defer, uh, with which you would defer to a, a, a patriarch, a senior in the household. And it says to encourage them, exhort them, don't rebuke them. Rebuke is, is seen as condescending talking down to them as you would a child. But exhortation is a reminder. Live in the way that you've learned to live. Finish the race that you've been given. Finish the race and finish it well. To young men, he says that you're to operate as brothers, almost in a peer-to-peer relationship. Proverbs 27, 17 says what? As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. So when we encounter men of similar age, whether we're male or female, we interact in a challenging manner. You challenge one another. I remember when I was, I was young, I would wrestle my brother. And we would, we would wrestle each other, sometimes seriously, angry, sometimes not. There was always a test of strength. Who was stronger? I would encourage you, do not practice the wrestling moves that they have on TV. They don't work. They don't work. Older women are to be treated as mothers. Mothers. In the Jewish family, the mother and the father were treated with equal dignity and respect. The matriarch and the patriarch together. For Timothy, uh, his mother and his grandmother were the ones who discipled him, who led him in the faith. They would have been significant women in his life. Many of us, when we were young, were brought up in the faith by women. Women who were leading our Sunday school classes as children. And lastly, young women to be encouraged, but with purity. Christ himself is pure, so purity is vital for his people. Timothy may or may not have been married, but we know he's a young man, and we know he's a young man now in a position of power in the Ephesian church. He's in charge. And as we've tragically seen over the last 10, 20 years, but it was going on long before that, sometimes men have a tendency to take advantage of their position of power and to uh, use it for their own gain in relationships with women. Timothy's being cautioned against this. And all of this together is one of the reasons why the church is beautiful. Because it's not just about diversity. It's not just about people of different ages being around each other. It's not even about uh, people of different ethnicities, different languages, different races. That's not what it's about. It's about the way in which the varying groups, the diverse groups, interact with one another. We are all disciples. We're all on this journey together. We're all pilgrims going in the same direction. And some of us might be further along than others. And the cool thing about the church is just because your hair is gray doesn't necessarily mean that you're spiritually further along in the journey than someone who's not. And that's okay. Some of us who are younger maybe are farther along, and that's okay. But we're all going in the same direction together. The part of the church, this church, that I think is beautiful is that there isn't a church for the old. There isn't a church for the young. Now, you might sit here and say, well, Travis, aren't you aware of the fact that at our church, we have multiple services. We have this service, and then we got the young people service down the, down the hall here. Aren't you aware? Well, fun fact, I am aware. 
that there is a service over there. But to call it the young people's service, I don't think that's accurate. Now, are there younger people there? Of course. But I look around this, again, I have a great view from everybody up here. You're all beautiful. And I can see people who are older than me, yes, but I also see a good number of people who are younger. To call this the older service is a misnomer. And to call that the younger service is also a misnomer. There's plenty of people over there that are older than me too. And I'm middle-aged-ish. Our church is beautiful. There is not a place for old people here and young people there. No, yeah, we have classes and things like that, and we break down on age two sometimes. But we have opportunities to mingle and to mix. We're a better church because people of different ages are around. And I have a theory as to why this year. I've long had this theory, and I'm excited to have the opportunity to share it. Being a young person, a younger person, it's incredibly hard to follow Christ. It's difficult to follow Jesus because life has a way of kind of beating your faith out of you, challenging you and making you ask questions like, is it worth it? Is God going to be faithful? Am I going to make it through this difficult season? But when I come here and I see people walking these halls that have lived longer in the faith than I have and their hair is grayer, I see that it can be done. I see that God maintains his faithfulness. I see that I can persevere because you did. Your existence is a reminder of God's goodness and faithfulness. Now, on the other hand, for you who are older, if you walk these halls and you see people who are younger, that should also be an encouragement. Because as you near, as, as you near that time, as we, we sang about when Christ calls you home, you may begin to doubt, is there going to be someone that comes after me? Is there gonna be someone to take the, that carries the fire that, that I can pass the torch onto? And the answer is, yes. You see people at our church. You see young families here walking these halls. You see young people. Now, yeah, culture changes, and maybe some of the things that were important before aren't as important now, and that's okay. But the core values, Christ crucified and resurrected, those things, the word of God, those things are gonna persist and maintain, and we remind each other of these things as we pass each other in the hall. So what I would encourage you to do just as a practical application. Because what we need to do is we need to accentuate the beauty of the church. This beauty that we have that's so important and special to park cities. When you have a really beautiful physical feature, you do things to accentuate it, right? If you have a really nice skin tone, you, you wear lotions or makeups or you do something. I don't have a nice skin tone, so I don't know how to do it. But you do something to make sure that you show it off, right? When you, when you have uh, uh, beautiful eyes, you do things with makeup and stuff to accentuate that. When you have uh, rippling biceps, you accentuate those rippling biceps. You don't wear sleeves, like ever. <laughs> if I had rippling biceps, you would see me up here cut off all the time. It'd be awesome. <laughs> but I don't, so we're covered up. One of the great things, one of the most, I would say maybe the most beautiful thing about our church is the intergenerational nature of her. And we need to accentuate that beauty. And one of the things that I would encourage you to do is when you come here on campus on Sunday morning or whenever you're here, look for someone who is older than you or if you're convinced that maybe there is no one older than you here, <laughs> you can look for someone younger. One of the great things about being Baptist is we all tend to sit in the same spot every single week. So you know where somebody's gonna be. Watch them. Come up to them, talk to them and say, hey, I see you here every week. I've never said hi my name's Travis, I, I, I worship with you and I don't know you. How are you? I'd like to talk to you. And then to get to know that person week in and week out, maybe, I know this is alarming, develop a friendship with them. We don't have to just be in our age groups because our church is beautiful all across the spectrum. So the beauty of the church Let's also talk about the beauty of the mature, the beauty of the mature. Uh, one of the most prominent myths, one of the most persistent myths in human history is the fountain of youth, the fountain of youth. And it started off with Herodotus, who was the first historian, uh, according to, to tradition. And then Alexander the Great also bathed in a fountain of youth, according to legend. I don't know how that worked out for him. I mean, he was 32 when he died. So kind of did, kind of didn't. But uh, as history's moved on, the, the most famous one that we know of here in the Western Hemisphere is Ponce de Leon and the Conquistador who was searching for uh, the Fountain of Youth. And where he legendarily found it was on the island of Bimini in the Bahamas, which I have been to the island of Bimini. I didn't know it was there. But if you're wondering my youthful appearance, 
I apparently bathed in the waters of the Fountain of Youth. Didn't even know it. But people have long sought out a way to turn back, if not aging itself, but to turn back the external uh, evidences of aging, right? We look for the Fountain of Youth in the bottom of a bottle. We dye our hair. We find creams and things to kind of wear around, weigh the crow's feet. Uh, we have pills that make us slow the effects of aging. We even get injections and surgeries so that we don't look quite as old as we are. But in Scripture, Scripture does not see the desire to turn back the time. Scripture sees aging, gray hair, as things to be honored, as beautiful things. They're treated as things to emulate. And 1 Timothy is absolutely uh, no different because Paul begins to talk about a group of women called widows. Now, for our purposes today, I'm going to talk about widows and, and the elderly synonymously. And the reason why I'm going to do that is because the, the widows that Paul is talking about, true widows, as he says, are probably were probably women who were, uh, husbands had passed away, certainly, but they were too old to get remarried and too old to have children of their own at that point. For how, whatever happened... Uh, they did not have kids. And in that society, the retirement plan was your family took care of you. And so these women did not have that option. They didn't have that opportunity. And so they were older and left in a position of vulnerability in that case. So I'm going to kind of look at that uh, elderly uh, sort, of, sort of synonymously with the widows. And what's, what's happening is uh, it can be mistaken to think that widows maybe didn't have a lot to offer in that church. Paul even says in verse 16, if you look over there, it says, uh, let the church not be burdened. Burdened. There's this perception, perhaps, that the widows were a burden. And if you extrapolate that, you can, and you go with senior adults and the elderly, some of us in our attitudes and our thoughts, those of us who are younger, can be guilty of thinking that maybe those who are older maybe don't have much to offer. Again, our society around us that idolizes youth can have that, that perception, that stereotype. And it's not true. It's not true. Because maturity is a value. It's a beautiful thing. And it has much to give us in the church. In fact, I would talk about two things that maturity has to give us. One, maturity undergirds our mission. Look at verse five. She was truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day, but she was self-indulgent, is dead, even while she lives. Real maturity, real maturity for Paul was aging both physically and spiritually. The true widow is one who set their hope fully on God. It's because she's had to. She's learned. Something has happened in her life. She's devoted in prayer and something has happened in her life that has, where she hasn't been able to rely on her wit, her guile, her resources. Something has happened where she's been completely at the mercy of the world and it is only God that she's counted on and God has brought her through it. And so she's learned. He's reliable. I can count on him. So her heart, her affections are turned to the Lord. Now, for some of us who are younger, we haven't had that challenge yet, or we haven't had one, uh, enough of them to push us that direction. And so the, the widow, the older widow here, the older woman, is a person of prayer. It is something she offers. And if we, again, take that and look at our own lives, our own people, our own church, our senior adults, that is something you have to offer. It is not the only thing, by all means, but it is definitely something you have to give. My mom lives in Georgia, and she's a senior adult. Uh, she'd hate me for saying that, but she is. Uh, she is, lives in Georgia, 12 hours away, and my mom does not do for my family everything that I know she wants to do. She wants to just randomly show up and babysit our kids, and she can't. She's 12 hours away. She wants to probably come over sometimes and clean my house, and I would let her, but she lives 12 hours away. My mom does a whole lot of things for our family. But one of the things that I know she does is she prays for me, she prays for my wife, she prays for my kids. And I get a text message from my mother every Sunday morning I preach telling me she's praying for me in a Bible verse. My mom upholds me in prayer. My father-in-law does the same. They pray for us. You can pray. That's a marker of being older. That's a marker of your season. Do you know that prayer matters and it's significant, it's important? Whereas some of us who are so busy with kids and a, and a young career, we lose track of that. But you've learned. On the other hand, look at verse 6. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Some of us as we age, and many of us who are younger and we look forward to retirement, think, man, it's going to be a time when I'm going to get to do the things I want to do, right? Retirement, I'm going to 
take that vacation I've always wanted to take. I'm going to develop that hobby that I've always wanted to develop. One, why are you waiting? You're not guaranteed a tomorrow. But two, our retirement years, our golden years are not for us solely. Nothing wrong with taking that vacation. Go learn that hobby. But are you taking all of that time for yourself? Is that your time? Or is God calling you into deeper, richer acts of service as you age, as you have more free time? Is God calling you? Just because you're a senior adult does not mean you're done serving. You may just be getting started. You can teach younger people's class. When you saw the pictures up there of the gathering, why were you not there? Were you not there because you felt like that was a young thing and you didn't have a place there? We're an intergenerational church. You have a place there. Wise woman told me this week as I asked her how I should speak in this message. She said, another day older is another day to experience God's grace and to bring glory and honor to him. Is that your approach to retirement? Is that your approach to your golden years? Because that's beautiful. Your maturity undergirds our mission. It doesn't hold us back. And if you think that about yourself, that is holding us back. On the other hand, their care, the care of the senior adult is a mirror for our maturity. For the rest of us, the way that we care for those in our midst, the senior adults, the elderly, that's the show of our maturity. If we think that we're mature and we're not caring for the previous generation, maybe we're not as mature as we think. Notice what it says in verses three and four. Paul says, honor widows who are truly widows, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents for this is pleasing in the sight of God. Pleasing in the sight of God means worship. This is worship. Caring for your mom and your dad, caring for elderly relatives is an act of worship. In fact, it's so important that right alongside of don't, ki- don't murder people, don't steal from people, don't worship other idols, uh, other gods, by the way, uh, take care of your mom and dad. It's like one of the big 10 things you're supposed to do. That's critical. It's critical. Look at verse seven through eight. Look at what he says on the flip side. Command these things as well so that they may be a, without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse, is worse than an unbeliever. Isn't this crazy? You know why it's worse than an unbeliever? Because unbelievers by instinct take care of their own. They take care of their own tribe. Wolves take care of members of their own pack. Lions take care of their own pride. By instinct, you take care of that which is like you. And when we ignore, when we neglect the previous generation, whether it's in our family or in our larger family of faith, we're worse than unbelievers. Why? Because even by instinct, you're supposed to do that. Let us take care of our own. Robert Yarborough gives three reasons why we should care for senior adults. He's a commentator. One, church health is determined by it. Many churches seek to grow. That's a good thing. Many churches seek to grow by targeting the next generation. We're going to be a church for the next generation. And that's a good thing. We're like that. You'll hear us say that. And I'm excited that that's how we are. But some churches choose to pursue the next generation at the expense of the previous one. And there's a subtle implication there in case you're not paying attention. Once you're outside of that target group, your church will no longer care for you. It's a dangerous thing. We are a church that wants to care for the next generation, yes, and disciple the next generation, yes. But we also want to be a church that disciples and cares for those of the previous generation. It's implicit. In the scriptures, it says true religion is caring for orphans and widows. Orphans, those in the next generation. Widows, those in the previous generation. That's beautiful. Another reason why we do it is because Jesus took care of widows. One of Jesus' last actions on the cross, one of the seven words that he said was to tell John, you're going to take care of my mom. So think about this. Jesus is doing the most important thing in the history of humanity. He is saving us from our sins. He is dying so that we might live, dying so that we can have a relationship with God because we're broken and we need a savior. And he's literally nailed to a cross, nailed to a piece of wood. And he's taking time to take care of his mom. Let me ask you this. Are you that busy? Oh, I'm too busy to take care. I'm too busy to take care of mom. I'm too busy to call mom. Too busy to call dad. Jesus wasn't. Lastly, the Old Testament praises the elderly. The story of scripture is driven along by senior adults. Abraham was fairly old when he got started following God. 
as was Moses and the like. If we're going to follow scripture, then we have to honor the previous generation. So there's beauty in that. There's also beauty in aging. Beauty in aging. Let's talk about this. The last uh, portion of this passage, verses 9 through 16, is all about a very practical application of this passage. Paul's telling Timothy, you're going to enroll women into this program. And these are the women that qualify in this program, and these are the women that don't. (coughs) Excuse me. These are the women that don't qualify. So it's very practical. And at the risk of taking scripture out of context, which I don't want to do, and I don't think I am, I want us to extrapolate from this how we can age well. Because the women who qualify and the women that don't qualify tell us how we might age well. We want to be in the qualifying group rather than the non-qualified group. So let's talk about this passage. One, we want to have a reputation. Have a reputation. Verse 9. Let a widow be enrolled if she's not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. This good works that that Paul's talking about is is the highest works. She's supposed to have a reputation like Mother Teresa or like Lottie Moon, the highest of reputations. We need to be people that have a high reputation both inside and outside the church. You age well, your reputation should increase, not decrease As people find out maybe more things about you, your reputation should increase. The longer you're on earth should be a sweeter time. Age, maturity should be marked by an increase in good works, not a decrease. So have a reputation. Then there's care for others. He moves into a for instance. This is all for instance. And all, every single one of these descriptors is something that is, a, uh, is caring for other people. Look what it says in verse 10. Reputation for good works, if she's brought up children, she's cared for the next generation, if she's poured into the next generation, then that's a marker of spiritual maturity, that's aging well. She's sown hospitality. Opening up our homes to people is a sign of aging well. Being more generous with the things we have, that's a sign of aging well. And on this topic, I would say this to those of you who are maybe facing the time in your life when you're having to ask questions about What's best for your mom and dad? Because as we age, some of us are not able to live on our own. And so our children are faced with the decision, what should we do with mom and dad? And hopefully you're able to to contribute and and engage in that conversation. And it can be a hard conversation to have. And so those of you that are facing that challenge, here's what I would suggest. I don't think there's anything wrong with with good care homes and facilities and a great ministry there. But I would encourage you in the interest of practicing hospitality, to ask yourself and prayerfully ask yourself and your family, could mom or dad move in with us? Could we open our home to them? And again, maybe that's a no. Maybe that's not even something they want. But our society has conditioned us to say that they go there. And we don't have to do that. If it's not necessary, if it's something they desire that we have. Again, nothing wrong with it. But it's something to consider. Care for others, right? He goes on. Uh, He says, those who have washed the feet of the saints, this is an act of service, or has cared for the afflicted, those who are burdened, those who are wounded, those who are suffering, she's cared for them and has devoted herself to every good work. This means that she's not going uh, and and waiting for people to show up and be like, hey, we've got some, we need some help, we need some help. She's going and seeking out opportunities to serve, seeking out opportunities to help. She's keeping her commitments. Look at verse 11. But refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. What this means is some of the younger women that were widows were going in and, and making a pledge and saying, I'll enroll in the program, but I'm not going to get married again. That's a commitment they made. But then after a while, they realized, yeah, you know what? I want to get married again. And so they'd break this vow. As we get older, there can be some temptations to walk away from some commitments we have. One of the ones that I thought of this week was that as we age, the commitment to our spouse can maybe weaken. Maybe you've raised uh, your kids, they've moved on, and you're sitting there with somebody that you haven't really spent time with in 20 years because you've been running around with the kids this time, and you're like, we don't know each other anymore. Would it be better if we went somewhere else and just kind of did our own thing? Don't. Don't. Keep your commitments. Maintain them. Stick to it. Keep busy, verse 13. Besides that, they learned to be idlers, going about from house to house. Basically, uh, as they aged, they became the Kardashians. They just kind of did whatever they wanted and was no good for anybody. As you age, many of us will have more time. We don't have work, we retire, and things like that. Some of us don't, but some of us do have more time. Is your time, as it becomes more free, 
Is your time with the Lord increasing as well? Or are you still doing the five-minute devotional that you would do before you worked a 12-hour day? Is that still how you start your day? Well, starting your day that way is great, but are you increasing your amount of time with the Lord in proportion to the amount of time you're increasing in other areas? Spend time in prayer. Spend time in worship. Lastly, watch your mouth. Verse 13. And not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. Now, there's a stereotype, again, a stereotype that older women are gossips. I said it's a stereotype. We do have an expression called old wives' tales. I don't know where it comes from. And one of the things that, that I think as, as I, that I enjoy just personally is I, I'm looking forward to the day when I get to be old enough to say what I want and nobody cares. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. There's going to be like, oh, that's Travis. He's, he's like a million years old. Don't worry about him. But I'm not there yet, so I'm trying to navigate this last part very carefully. As you age, let your words drip with honey. Be a person who's thoughtful in speech, whose heart is open to listening and speaking good, gracious, godly things to other people. Be that kind of person as you age. I hope that you have felt that our church is very beautiful because she is because she's old, been around since 1939. You are a beautiful body of Christ, whether you are very, very young or not so much. You are beautiful, and you're beautiful because Christ loves you. And here's one of the reasons why we don't have to be afraid of aging. Many of us are afraid of aging because we know what waits on the other end of aging is death. But there is one who has defeated death. He suffered and died so that we might live eternally. Age is not something to be feared. It's just a beautiful part of life. So let us praise our God who has made all of our years beautiful by the sacrifice of his son. And if you want to know how you can know him, you can come talk to me after the service. I'd love to talk with you. But praise God that he's given us a place and a people to worship with who don't all look alike. And sometimes that's young, old, in the middle. Praise God. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters in this room. I thank you for my younger brothers and sisters, and I thank you for my older brothers and sisters as well. I thank you that there are fathers and mothers in this room, spiritual fathers and mothers, who have poured into my life and continue to pour into my life. I thank you with gratitude for their sweet service to you, Lord, and I pray that all of us, every person that can hear this, Lord, would persevere in their faith, and if that faith is not yet theirs, I pray that you would wake it up in them today. Lord God, we love you. And it's in your son's great name we pray. Amen.